Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, event uh, entitled Prospects for Peace, Facts and Fiction. I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome you and to let you know that this event is being sponsored by the uh, Episcopal Bishops Committee for Peace and Justice in Palestine, Israel. In, uh, I would love it if the people from the committee could st stand up. Don Sullivan, Richard, uh, yes, great. Just so you know who they are. Yeah. They've worked really hard on, uh, and you know, sort of underwrite the whole event and all the controversy that goes with it. And then also, also being co-sponsored by the Kairos Pujits Coalition. I see Karen Noor, John Berg, myself, Huda Giddens, we're part of that group too. So uh, the way the evening is going to go is that uh, following an introduction of everybody up here, uh, Elan will make his presentation, followed by a uh, discussion responses from John McKay and Alice Rothschild. At the same time, while they are discussing, we will be collecting the cards with your questions. And that I think everybody has received a card. If not, just raise your hand. And we'll collect the cards. And we've got three or four people reviewing the cards. And we'll give the questions to John and Alice. And uh, they'll ask Alan, since he'll be thinking rather than reading. <laughs> And we'll have a discussion, and then we'll finish up about 8.45, at which point uh, you can buy, and Alan will sign the books, his most recent book that he has. Alice is selling her book down. She'll go back downstairs, and uh, we'll celebrate the evening. So uh, by way of introduction, Alan uh, Pape was born in Haifa in 1954. He's an Israeli historian and a social activist. He's now currently a professor with the College of so Social Sciences and International Studies at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom and director of the University European Studies, a Center for Palestinian Studies, and is supervising uh, a number of doctoral students on their theses. Uh, he travels a great deal. He's written 16 books at least. I think he writes them on the plane. He's been in three continents in the last week. So his, uh, his time center is constantly being readjusted. He's uh, well known for his book, The uh, Ethnic Cleansing at Palestine and the Mid Modern Middle East, The History of Modern Palestine. And currently his new book was just came out last week. It's called 10 Myths About Israel. And that's available. He's regarded as one of the uh, leading Israeli new historians who since the release of pertinent British and Israeli government documents in the early 1980s have been rewriting the history of Israel's creation in 1948 with the corresponding expulsion of or flight of the 700 Palestinians in that same year. And I'll leave it to Alan to elaborate on that in greater detail. Our two discussants are uh, Dr. Alice Rothschild. She's a uh, was on the faculty at the Harvard Medical School as an uh, obstetrician and gynecologist for over 40 years, and uh, has also been very active in the uh, seeing what's happening in writing about the activities and oppression in Israel, and has several books out, including a new book out called In Critical Condition. And um, Alice recently, she and her husband moved from Boston to be a grandmother, grandparents, and we're delighted, and we call on Alice at least once or twice a year, so we're really happy that she's here. Uh, John McKay is a, served as a, uh, the U.S. Attorney for Western Washington from 2001 to 2006, at which point he then left quickly, and, uh, <laughs> and joined the faculty of Seattle University School of Law in 2007, and uh, teaches a number of courses, constitutional law and national security law. He um, had the opportunity in 2013 to 2015 to be the chief of the team for the rule of law project 
in uh, the West Bank, and with 50, 60 Palestinian lawyers and other people, he helped to strengthen the rule of law in the West Bank. And a two-year experience in Ramallah, Ramallah changes your life, and so uh, we call on John at least once or twice a year to come and talk with us, and we're, we're very happy that we have such exciting people here in Seattle. So I will uh, ask Alon to come to the podium and welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I'm not waiting for a phone, I just want to keep my time. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here for the second time. My last uh, time, the last time I was here on this uh, podium was 2011, uh, and we had a very lively debate with someone representing J Street. Uh, this time I am a bit of a, alone a little bit, but thank God there are two people next to me, so uh, this is a bit of a return to six years ago. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for making the effort uh, to bring me over. Particularly, I want to mention McDonald Sullivan, who really chased me physically all around the globe to make sure that uh, I will not forget my promise to come back. So thank you. Thank you, Don, for your uh, steadfastness. For those of us who are long-time activists on, on Palestine, and those of us who teach on Palestine either as official academics or as part of our activism or any other occupation that leads us to engage with the problem of Palestine, there is a growing frustration, I think, between the gap between the gap uh, about the gap between the way the mainstream media, in a way also the mainstream academia, and definitely the mainstream politics, depict the conflict in Israel and Palestine on the one hand, and what we feel is the essence of the conflict, what we feel is the reason for the conflict and the lack of progress in the attempts to solve it. Uh, even if you read the New York Times in this country, uh, even if you hear academics and politicians who are not denying the existence of a Palestinian people, who probably have been even to the West Bank, if not to the Gaza Strip, even when you hear these people, and let alone if you listen to those who haven't been there uh, and who are not as open-minded as the, the New York Times, for instance, or the Washington Post, even if you, hear, if you hear the most progressive one and the less progressive one, the way that they tend to explain the origins of the conflict, the essence of the conflict, the reasons for any lack of progress in solving the conflict, is very far, I think, from the way we understand it, from the way we sense it uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And for many years I thought maybe the problem is that these people, whether progressive enough or not progressive enough, maybe the problem is that they're not spending enough time in the West Bank. Maybe they haven't seen enough of the Israeli atrocities on a daily basis. Maybe they should uh, have more access to what goes on in the Gaza Strip. Maybe what is missing is more information. And then I came across these same people in government, in academia, in the media, being exposed to more information, and yet they remain uh, loyal to the same basic assumptions 
wrong assumptions about the conflict, its origins, its essence, and the chances to solve it. And this is why I think that the problem is not only lack of knowledge of what goes on currently in Palestine. The problem is not even the fact that next door to Israel and Palestine, even worse atrocities are being committed, which is the new excuse we hear for why Palestine is removed from the international attention and why there is lack of international interference in what goes on. I don't think that these are the reasons. I don't undermine the importance of people being well informed of what goes on today in Palestine. I don't underestimate the importance of uh, uh, the events in uh, Syria and Iraq in shadowing what goes on uh, in Palestine. I take this all into account. But even with all these explanation, I still find the basic understanding of why there is a conflict in Palestine and Israel and why this conflict is so crucial for the future of the Middle East and beyond is very far from what people like myself and I suspect quite a lot of those who are here tonight feel about the conflict, its origin, and its future. And the only way, I think, of challenging the wrong perceptions of Palestine, the misinformed assumptions that lead to the diplomatic effort that leads to nowhere, that uh, create a charade about Israel as the only democracy in the Middle East, or create this uh, narrative that peace is very nearby, around the corner, and all you need is either an able Palestinian leader or a brave Israeli uh, leader, and that's, or maybe a grown-up American mediator, which is not exactly what we have in this moment in time. Uh, and, and then the, the uh, issue is resolved. The only way of challenging these mis conceptions, unfortunately for us as activists, is to go back to history. Why do I say unfortunately? Because this is the 21st century. People don't have, it seems, time and energy to listen to long, profound analyses. People prefer sound bites. They want binary explanation, who is bad, who is good, they want it in three to four minutes. The span of attention is no longer than five minutes. We are defeated by the very technology sometimes that enable us in a way to bring more information on what goes on in Israel and Palestine today. There is no way of understanding what goes on today, to my mind, in the right context, unless you are also a student of history. And the reason you have to be a student of history is not because of an intellectual interest in the past. No, this is not the reason. It is because the ch historical chapter that began in Palestine with the arrival of the Zionist movement is still going on today. We have not concluded that chapter. We are in the same time zone as the beginning of Zionism. This is not, we don't have a closure of that chapter. So we're not actually going to study history. We're going to study our own contemporary reality, even if that particular moment began 70 years ago or maybe even 100 years ago. And there is a very good explanation why we are still in the same time zone when Zionism started, and why are we still faced with the same problems that Zionists put in front of us as Palestinians, as Jews, and as people around the world who are interested in Israel and Palestine. We, are, we have to deal with Zionism as a structure, not as an event. It's a structure. 
And a structure in history means that yes, there is a moment when this structure is exposed, when this structure begins, but we are still inside this structure. And that particular structure which is, uh, we, we are in, recently was very well defined by scholars in various parts of the world. That particular structure is settler colonialism. In fact, one of the great writers on settler colonialism who just passed away, uh, unfortunately, Patrick Wolf, has this famous quote where he says, settler colonialism is not an event, it is a structure. I translate it to my particularly case study, Zionism is not an event, it is a structure. And it is a settler colonialist structure. Now, in Israel, at this point, even those who wouldn't understand what settler colonialism is would walk out of this hall. The fact that you are still here after I said that Zionism is settler colonialism made this trip worthwhile. And most of those people who would walk out from the hall really wouldn't know what settler colonialism is, but they would be offended by the word colonialism. Two years ago, I organized a, a conference in my university, the University of Exeter, under the title Settler Colonialism in Palestine. And immediately there was an outcry in Britain. The Board of Deputies, which is the main Jewish organization, various pro-Israeli lobbies, even the Prime Minister's office at the time was David Cameron, called my university and said, you have to stop this conference from taking place because it's an anti-Semitic conference. To his credit, my vice chancellor said to the politicians who called him, do you know what settler colonialism is? And they said, no, but it doesn't sound good. I said, well, <laughs> well, he said, you should come to Exeter and attend the conference. You may learn something about settler colonialism. And this is typical, this is, this is part of the, of the obstacle we face if we want to have a serious, profound, analytical discussion about Palestine. And we need, there's no way of, of going around it. There's no way of having a soundbite exchange about Palestine. There's only a, a moment, where the, there comes a moment where you say to people, yes, it is complicated, Yes, it's information that takes time to take in. But if you really think that Palestine and Israel are important, you will have to make the effort. I always am bewildered when I, I'm on such stages with uh, some of my compatriots from Israel who are supposed to present the opposite side. When they use the same sentence that I'm using about the reality as being complicated for exactly the opposite purpose. They would say to the audience, this is such a complicated story, you will never understand it. So leave it to us, we understand what it is all about. No, intelligent people, educated people don't need much time to understand, but it's important to understand, or at least to comprehend that there is a total misunderstanding about what goes on from the level of the politicians, so the highest levels of politicians through mainstream media, mainstream academia. Part of it, part of the misunderstanding is intentional. Part of it is people who grew up in a certain ideological or theological or cultural uh, environment that does not allow them to see the reality in Israel and Palestine in any different way from the way their parents or their communities were uh, conditioned to see. So let me go back to this idea of settler colonialism because I think it's, it's a crucial point. Settler colonialism, as you would know from the history of this country, is the movement of Europeans outside of Europe. And these people are moving outside of Europe in different moments in time. 
and mostly these movements are different from the expansion of empires into other parts of the world. These are movements of communities, of individuals, sometimes according to the lines of imperial expansion, sometimes preceding imperial expansion or following imperial expansion. Most of these people are persecuted for various reasons. And most of these people have no wish to stay in Europe and are looking for a new home. And they want also, when it comes to the 18th century, 19th century, they want to create also a new homeland. And in many cases, the main obstacle for creating a new safe homeland for people who were victims of persecution is the fact that they choose places where someone else is already living. <laughs> and that's a problem. And that's a problem. And in many cases, the settlers dehumanize the natives and the indigenous to such an extent that they find it in their heart to genocide them, to eliminate them, or to impose an apartheid system on them, or as in the case of the Palestine, to strive and get them out of their homeland, homeland or as I called it in 2007, to ethnically cleanse them from their homeland. If we can, at any given moment, in, enable, if at any given moment we can explain to people that there were many positive impulses behind Zionism, very noble, I would say even, impulses behind Zionism. The wish to save the Jews from what definitely was eventually uh, a genocide in Europe. The wish of people to become modern and a modern nation. Even the wish to be reconnected to the Holy Land or the land of the Bible. These are all not negative impulses. These are understandable. But you cannot exclude the additional impulse which complicates this complicated life for all of us. The other impulse that is not talked about is to get rid of the people who were already there in the land of the Bible. That were already modernized themselves. That were already building a national identity and collective identity. Who lived there for centuries and were entitled to continue their normal life and to make their own decisions about the future, whether they were good decisions or bad decisions, this is totally irrelevant. This was their homeland, and someone else came, immigrated into their homeland, and slowly but surely began to expel them and dispossess them in a process that started 100 years ago and reached a climax in 19. 48. There's no escaping from this. There's no way of rewriting that history. There's no escape from, from telling the Israeli Jews your ideology of who you are and who the Palestinians are was formed in that historical moment when your grandfathers and grandmothers, your modern ancestors decided what quite a lot of Europeans decided elsewhere in the world, that in order to create a safe homeland, yes, in order to create or reconstruct ancient Israel, call it what you want, you were fully aware that the only way you could do it is by getting rid of the Palestinian population. And there is no escape because it, is, it exists in every Trevelock that your leaders have written on the way to Palestine. It appears in every diary that they kept. It is to be found in the archives of the Zionist movement and the archives of the Israeli state. You didn't hide it in 1882 because it was quite legitimate to talk about depopulation in 1882. You didn't even feel it was wrong to ask the British government in 1930 to help you to transfer all the Palestinians outside of Palestine because this was 
an accepted language in 1930. So we don't blame you for being the same as many other European settlers who came to a different place. But you came very late in the day, and the Palestinians, to their credit, resisted you in the name of Palestinian nationalism. In 1936, they began a serious revolt against you, against the idea that you had the right to dispossess them, not that you have the right to live next to them. This you had the right, and they never denied you the right to live next to them. They resisted against your plan to dispossess them. And had not the British government helped the Zionist movement between 1936 to 1939 to destroy the Palestinian military elite and political elite, probably the resistance would have been even more successful than it was. And when you had a Zionist a great historical moment in 1948 to translate the idea of dispossession of the Palestinians from an abstract strategy that a small minority of Jews in mandatory Palestine could not implement, to translate it into a proper military strategy of expulsion, you did it. You understood very well as a political movement that three years after the Holocaust, the world would allow you to expel the Palestinians and wouldn't do anything against it. You knew that there was no leadership on the Palestinian side. You knew that the Arab world was busy with its own liberation struggles. Yes, you were very clever as politicians, as leaders of a political movement. 48 was the right moment to do it, especially because the British decided to leave Palestine. And you manipulated very well the international community to depict the Palestinians as the people who resist peace, who refuse to accept peace. You offered them to partition their homeland and to leave them 50% of their homeland. And you described their rejection of this generous offer, a term you will use again and again in your dealings with the Palestinians as intransigence, as typical of a, polit of a political culture in the Arab world, not progressive, not modern enough. And that's why, that's why the people of Palestine foolishly did not agree to give half of their homeland to a group of hundreds of thousands of Jews, mostly, most of them arrived, arrived in Palestine only two years before. Who wouldn't? in the world say, I will give half of my country to immigrants who have just arrived two years ago. The, the cynical way in which so many people accepted that this was a foolish Palestinian position, that it had no moral basis, that it had no political wisdom, the, the, the cynical stance was so powerful that even some Palestinians began to believe in it that it was a terrible mistake in 1947 not to accept the solution of the partitioning Palestine to an Arab state and a Jewish state. And remember, the Jews were one third of the population. Most of them came in 1945. And they had an ideology of ethnic cleansing that anything, anyway would have been implemented even if the Palestinians would have accepted the partition plan. And yet, even among people around the world who support the idea of two-state solution, you can hear them saying the Palestinians made a terrible mistake in 1947 when they rejected the partition plan. Not to mention the Israeli propaganda that wants to show it that Palestinians were always rejecting peace plans. This particular peace plan ended in the expulsion of half of Palestine's population and the demolition of 500 Palestinian villages out of 1,000 in the destruction of all the Palestinian towns, except for one town, the town of Nazareth. And this all happened in nine months. The world was watching. The world knew exactly what was going on. And the world was silent about the Palestinian tragedy. And the message from the world brings us back to the idea of settler colonialism 
as a structure. If the international community in 1948 would have said to Israel, colonialism, settler colonialism, this belongs to the 19th century. We are in a different century. Three years after the Holocaust, we do not sanction massive expulsions of people just because of their identity. Imagine if that would be in the international community, say. And to the credit of someone who I don't like, John Foster Dallas, the Secretary of State in 1949, to his credit, I should say, for the record, he is the only international statesman who said what I'm saying here. To his credit. In fact, he succeeded in convincing President Truman for a few months to impose sanctions on Israel for not allowing the Palestinian refugees to return. And then he was silenced and America reorientated its policy, as you know, towards Israel and Palestine to the lines that we are familiar with today. But no, no one else had even thought of sending a message to Israel that this is not the way to compensate the Jewish people for the genocide that happened in Europe. This is not the way to build a secure democratic Jewish homeland on Palestine at the expense of Palestine without succeeding in fully defeating the Palestinians. So the message from the world was, if you haven't completed your settler colonialist project, why don't you continue it? You will continue to have international immunity. So between 1948 and 1967, Israel expelled from within Israel another 36 villages. The Palestinians who were left out of the one million Palestinians who lived in what was Israel, uh, 150,000 were left. They were put under military rule. Those who live today in the West Bank know exactly what the military rule means. It means that a soldier is a little king in his kingdom and can destroy your shop, can prevent you from going to university, can arrest you without trial, can shoot and kill you without being worried about it. The Palestinian citizens of Israel were under such military rule between 1948 to 1966. And it's fascinating to read the reports of the State Department about this situation. How they accept, cynically I think, the Israeli explanation that this is temporary and therefore nobody in the world should really pay much attention to the fact that one-fifth of the Israeli population has, doesn't enjoy basic human and civil rights. So the message came loud and clear when in 1967 Israel occupied the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and incorporated another group, even larger group of Palestinians under Israeli rule. We have the documents from the Israeli meetings immediately after the occupation. And what these documents reveal is how the biggest charade on earth was designed. The Israeli government in 1967, and yes, uh, Mary, this is another book written on a plane that will come out in June called The Biggest Prison on Earth. I, I tell about these cabinet meetings because I think they're very important. In the Israeli cabinet or government in 1967 had to decide, or was the first group of politicians that had to decide what to do with the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. It was a unique group of people, uh, the members of the cabinet in 1967. It was the 13th government of Israel. And uh, it was the most consensual government Israel ever had and ever is going to have. Every shade, every shade of, of the political parties in Israel uh, was represented in that gov government. Socialists uh, alongside Zionists, uh, uh, capitalists, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews alongside very secular uh, uh, Jewish parties. Everyone was part of that government. And I think that's why that government felt, rightly, that it represents Zionism in full. And they took three decisions that were the basis for the charade. That we all, not hopefully not here, but so many of us still play with. 
The first decision was that Israel could not exist without the West Bank. And this is something that it's even hard to explain to Palestinians in the West Bank that still believe in a two-state solution. It doesn't matter whether you're on the left, whether you're on the right within the Zionist politics in Israel. 67 was seen as the historical moment, not just from a religious perspective, namely that you were given all the ancient biblical towns that are the heart of the ancient kingdom, but that strategically you got rid of what Abba Ibn, the Israeli foreign minister at the time, called the Auschwitz borders of Israel. The government was very clear that in no circumstances could Israel exist without the West Bank. They had only tactical disagreement of how best to achieve it. And what was so fascinating for me as an historian is how these tactical disagreement was seen in the world as genuine uh, ideological disagreement about Zionism. These are tactical. Whether you are on the left and say, I don't have to control every part of the West Bank, I can build a wall, which is what liberal Zionists decided to do. I can build a wall around the West Bank, so I don't need to control it, but I only need to control the River Jordan. Or you are a right-wing who said, no, I have to, because of ideology, I have to be in every part of the West Bank. It doesn't matter. In the end of the day, the West Bank, which is 20% of Palestine, cannot be really out of Israel's reach and control and rule. Yes, there is the real politic of the pragmatic left that says rule does not have to be official, rule doesn't have to be formal, and the ideological stance of the right wing in Israel that says, no, we need to show that this belongs to us, every square inch belongs to us. In the end of the day, in the end of the day it means that those of us who believe in a two-state solution should understand that as long as Israel is the powerful party that it is, there will never be a Palestinian state to talk about, a real Palestinian state in the West Bank. So that was the first decision. The second decision was, okay, we keep the territories and we will argue for years how best to keep it. But what we will do with the people? There was a genuine discussion of whether Israel should not repeat in 67 what it did in 1948. Because settler colonialism is a structure. It's a DNA. It's not a policy. And they had a serious discussion whether they had the capacity and the circumstances to expel millions of Palestinians so that the West Bank could be easily Judaized. They decided that in 67 you cannot do what you could do in 48. A, because the war was already over. Secondly, there was television. Thirdly, many of the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were refugees from 48, and there was a fear that they would resist even strongly the second expulsion than they did resist the first expulsion. And they were even worried about the reactions of Syria and, and uh, Jordan and Egypt, the countries where we were supposed to receive these masses of, of, of refugees. So they decided not to expel the people. So if you keep the territory and you don't expel the people, what would be the status of the people? They, they discussed it. Surprisingly, the leader of the right-wing party, Menachem Begin, said, well, in that case, we should grant them citizenship. That makes sense. And the Labour Party, that was the dominant ideological power in 67, said, you're crazy. We cannot have a Jewish state if we don't have a demographic majority of Jews. A Jewish democratic state means you have to make sure all the time that the Jews are the majority. So if you grant them citizenship, you downsize the number of Jews in the Jewish state to dangerous levels. So Begin asked the Minister of Defense at the time, Moshe Dayan, so what do you suggest? And he said, well, you know, they would be without any citizenship. And Abba, even the foreign minister asked, for how many years can people live without basic civil rights 
and human rights. And the chilling response from Moshe Dayan was, well, at least for 50 years. Today, we are in the 50s years of this inhumanity that was devised in 1967. But where is the charade? And with this, I would come to a close. The charade was that the 13th government of Israel understood that it would have a problem with the international community if these three decisions would be the only decisions the government had been taken, even if there were secret decisions that at the time were not publicized. So they took a false decision, and that was to have a peace process. On the basis that Israel can never give up the West Bank, on the basis that the citizens of the West Bank the inhabitants of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip would never be expelled, although they were massively expelled for various reasons, but not in the same way as in 1948, and on the basis that they would never be granted citizenship by the Israelis. But the peace process, as the Israelis understood very well, as Noam Chomsky once commented rightly, the important word is not peace. The important word is process. The process doesn't have to lead to anywhere. It goes on and on and on, and you can create the sense that it's temporary, that the reality is temporary, that you are waiting for something good to happen, and you're doing all the bad things that you are doing because there's no peace. But there is a process, and as long as there's a process, you demand international immunity. Now, you can rely, and they knew it beforehand, you can rely on the fact that the kind of prison that you created for the people of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip would be resisted. You can also rely on the fact that if you, as the Israeli government, not someone on the extreme right, begin to send Jewish settlers to colonize the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, you will even make, you'll be even more confident that the people there would resist. Resistance allows you to retaliate and to be even more brutal. It's amazing how for 50 years, and it doesn't matter which government and which political party you were talking about, for 50 years, whenever Palestinian resistance emerged, the Israeli response was to build more settlements, to give the Palestinians less rights than they had, to install more checkpoints, to build a wall, to use the Air Force for the first time to carpet bomb the city of Jenin in 2002, to destroy the city of Gaza with scenes that we've only seen before in the Second World War. This was all done as a response, as retaliation for these Palestinian terrorists. But they were not terrorists. They were people who resisted the 1967, and still resist, the 1967 creation of the biggest prison on earth, one in the West Bank and one in the Gaza Strip. And they will continue to resist. And the Israelis would continue to say, well, if they continue to resist, we have to build more settlements. We have to extend the wall. We have to make it higher than it is. And we, have, we are entitled to use even more inhuman lethal weapons in Gaza. There is a direct line between the international legitimacy to Zionism and settler colonialism in Palestine and the international immunity and silence to the most recent Israeli atrocities, and you can take your pick, because it's very difficult to highlight which of the last Israeli policies in, uh, in two, 2016 is worse than the other. And don't forget that these Ide this ideology of settler colonialism is not limited to the West Bank, is not limited to the Gaza Strip. There are Palestinian villages in the south of Israel that has be have been demolished for the 40s, if not the 50s time. Their crime, that they tried to build and maintain a village which was there for centuries. There are demolition of houses all over the Palestinian areas inside Israel in order to downsize 
both the space in which Palestinians live and the numbers of Palestinians. And there are leg legislation going on in Israel, which is the natural consequences of a settler colonialist mentality that does not allow the Palestinians to commemorate 1948 as a catastrophe, does not recognize them as part of the nation of the state, does not recognize their language as a language of the state. I'm sure that from the point of view of international law, almost 95% of the Israeli laws that were passed in the Knesset about the Palestinians and 100% of the practices on the ground would be regarded as severe violation of the most basic international law. And I'm not talking again about only what's happening in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but also inside Israel itself, where is, by law you can declare a whole town a town for Jews alone. Imagine if a city in America would be declared only for Christians. What an outcry would, be, would it be there? In a law, not in, by practice, which is bad enough, by law. So we have to ask ourselves, how does Israel get away with so I come to the beginning of my talk, and with this I would end. It gets away with it because people do not know the history I was giving you today. And when I and my friends are trying to tell this history, there, a huge effort is being made to undermine our scholarly uh, uh, credentials, our knowledge, but they're losing, they're losing. We are recognized by the international community as good scholars, as reliable scholars, as truthful scholars. The question is, can now that the truth is known, now that people know they cannot hide behind ignorance, would they have the courage to help us save the Palestinians from another 100 years of suffering? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alan. That was excellent. Uh, I, I'm hoping that the uh, questions are being collected by Joshua, Sima, and uh, maybe Maggie Coit. My granddaughter can collect them. But anyway, um, so we'll collect the questions that you have. It'll just make it easier. And uh, Alice, take it away. Thank you. So thank you so much for this uh, very good overview of history here. Um, I was wondering, you're also a historian and an activist, and I'm wondering, uh, when you look towards the future, and you look at the issue of global warming, and increasing drought, and the impact on people searching for water, refugees, uh, the use of water as a weapon by the Israeli government, how do you see that all playing out for the future? Yeah, thank you, Alice. Uh, let me start by saying that, uh, as you should know here, and I, I just recently saw it uh, in a winery, which I won't name, in the Napa Valley, which was on the land of Native Americans. And these wineries brought with them carps, a fish that they loved in uh, Croatia, where they came from. And the carps, destroyed the whole natural cycle in what were holy, uh, sacred land with its own water system, rivers, and so on, by bringing a settler colonialist fish that <laughs> ate the indigenous. There was not enough to, to kill the indigenous themselves. They also brought a killer fish. And I'm saying this because settler colonialism can also be an ecological disaster. It has to be an ecological disaster because unless you have settled in paradise, you always settle in places where natural resources are limited, where uh, you need to build a new infrastructure as a settler. You cannot rely on the existing infrastructure because your project is a project of elimination. 
And uh, if, as in the case of Palestine, the half of the indigenous people are still there, you cannot give them the same access to natural resources as you give to your own people. What is horrifying, I think, in this whole story about water quotas to the Palestinians and the restriction on water supply to the Palestinians uh, are my colleagues, I used to teach in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies in the University of Haifa, are my Orientalist colleagues who would explain that Palestinians do not need that much water. We heard it before. We heard it before. And if you go to a beautiful village near Ramallah called Jafne, which was known all over the place for the canals of water that divided the houses, or you go to what well, today is a refugee camp, but wasn't a refugee camp before 48, Jalazun, which in Turkish, Ottoman Turkish means the crystal clear water. You know that, or oh, Walaja near Bethlehem, you know that some of the most beautiful parts of Palestine that were connected to free flow of water, to access to clean water, was taken by Israel, put, put into pipes, directed to the settlements, and the Palestinians now have to buy their own water from the settlers for double the price or triple the price. This is beyond control. This is viciousness. This is evil. This is real evil. So I think it's important to understand that yes, one can talk about global warming as a whole, and of course the whole Middle East would be, and we have all these doomsday scenarios of the lack of water and what is called the river wars. People were fighting for water and so on. I think what the case of Israel and Palestine shows you, that the problem may be scarcity of water, we don't know, although people know, have found some solutions, but the main problem is that there, if there are around ideological movements who exploit this, the, secret, the, 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 the uh, dress of natural resources in order to enforce their political projects. And I think this is why we should study also, if you want, the water policy of Israel and connect the ecological development to the ideologies. This is, by the way, not only true about Israel. I don't want to put only Israel there. Egypt plays its own role with the water of Sudan. Uh, uh, there are issues in Iraq and Syria as well. I'm, I'm just saying that in every other part in the Middle East, people immediately identify the culprits and immediately recognize the crime and immediately know what to do. In the case of Israel, very few people are willing to point at the criminals and describe exactly the nature of that crime. Well, thank you very much for your lecture, Ilan. Uh, enjoyed it very much, and I appreciated your uh, uh, emphasizing the role of scholars and scholarship in understanding this problem. But I think I'd be remiss in not pointing out that we Americans have sent a great scholar, Donald Trump, to <laughs> to the land of, of Israel and Palestine, and he's there now. And I guess my question, which of course is somewhat facetious already, um, I think it would be good to hear your comment on whether or not this view that maybe sending an anti-scholar, or someone who doesn't know anything, um, who is not bound by convention, who isn't looking at, for example, the two-state solution, which I think I share with you is dead and is not going to happen, that maybe, maybe, there is some new approach that someone might stumble into without perhaps the scholarship that, you're, that you were mentioning? I can see that. I can see that happening. <laughs> uh, but I think much more as the constellation of balls on the pool table or billiard table, mm -hmm. namely that he can do something that tr would trigger something else that can trigger a chain of events that eventually uh, can begin a new understanding of the reality. I mean, he, he could destroy something that was there unintentionally and that would force us to rebuild it. I don't think he will bring us an idea for reconstruction. I think he's good at demolition. 
I don't think he's very good at building. For a constructor, he's not very good at building things. So I think he will demolish. It's quite possible that he will demolish something. And I think you're right. Demolition, when the status quo is against you, and you can hear Palestinians have a very Palestinians always have a very interesting take on realities that are very worrisome for Europeans and Americans, like the election of Trump or Brexit mm -hmm. in, in, in Britain. They understand that basically you're talking here a bit of an earthquake, that something, the, co the, the natural progression of things has been disrupted. Now maybe if you live good life in Britain, you don't want it to happen. But if you live at the pit, at the bottom, the worst that can happen is the same. The, something, but maybe something good can happen out of it. So, so I think there's something there, uh, not because of his lack of scholarship, but because of the unpredictability of what he's going to do and so on. But to be honest, there is a different scenario, which is also possible, which with the risk of uh, being a bit futuristic about it, I don't think that he would change much in Israel and Palestine. I think the, that the rhythm that had affected this part of the world in the last 10 years would continue. Namely, it's the same but a bit worse every year. Not dramatically worse, but it's a bit worse. And I think during all his years in office, this would be the picture. What would cause a disruption, I don't think, is Donald Trump. I think what will cause a disruption are the Palestinian people themselves, who may direct their anger against, not just against Israel, but also against the Palestinian Authority, I think that what can cause the disruption are the Palestinians in Israel who are an assertive group of Palestinians who are beginning to have enough of the Israeli apartheid policies and legislation and of course the unpredictability of what goes around us in Israel and Palestine. Who knows? When will it spill over? It will spill over, there's no doubt. When will it spill over and how will it spill over to Israel and Palestine? Uh, I may repeat something, probably I already said it here in 2011, but I can repeat it. When, uh, because it, it must have been the early days of the Arab, uh, so-called Arab Spring, when everybody in Israel said, thank God we are not going to be affected by these developments, we're not part of it. And I said to them, I think maybe I said it here as well, I don't remember. I said, you know, even if you have the best cabin on the Titanic, you're still on the Titanic. <laughs> so I think that's what the Israelis are going to learn in the next year or two. Um, so you, you mentioned the Palestinian Authority and Abbas is, what, 82 years old and there's no secession plans. Um, what, you know, can you guess what's going to happen in the next five, ten years in terms of the Palestinian Authority, the leadership in Palestine? Comments on that? That deserves a historian, that all the questions are about the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told us about the past. Uh, that, so. Exactly. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, you know, it's because I really think, with the risk of, of predicting, that the situation is not going to change dramatically, I still think that the Palestinian Authority can hold on for the next three to five years and uh, they can create a succession if they want. They have several candidates. And I think that also we have to be uh, careful by pushing the Palestinian Authority out of the picture. I mean, uh, uh, chaos is not better than what we have now. So it's, 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 it's a question uh, of whether uh, we can create one of the two processes which can benefit us. One is a process by which you gradually convince the people who are part of the Palestinian Authority that it's their in, it is in their interest to hand the keys over to the Israelis and force the Israelis to, to be part of the apartheid, to, officially to create the apartheid state of Israel for everyone to see. Not easy, because you can always believe in the West Bank that maybe you will be able to liberate more of what you have and maybe it will work. The other 
possible development is that people would have enough and this would explode and it would not be uh, an incremental process but far more uh, revolutionary. Uh, but it's very difficult to, 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 to predict and, and I think it's very important to engage all the Palestinian uh, and all the Israelis are interested in being engaged in it, but I think in particular the Palestinians, to engage all of us in, in a conversation about the alternative, about the alternative uh, vision, alternative solution, to start seriously talking, whether you are in power or outside of power, and I think it's time for the Palestinians to lead this conversation because we saw what happened in the last 70 years when the Israelis and the Americans led the conversation of peace. It deepened the occupation, it deepened the colonization. You need the colonized, the occupy, to draw the picture of the future, not the colonizer. Because the colonizer will always draw a picture that would not be that different from the status quo. It would have cosmetic changes with the hope that this will satisfy the colonized for another five or six years. That's all they want. And I think we have to change the conversation on that. We have some questions now that are coming from our, okay. our audience, which uh, I know um, you're excited to hear. And <laughs> the first one I want to ask you is, is uh, a question from, from our audience about, uh, you're an activist as well as a historian, and this is an activist question, which is, okay. what, what are your views of the BDS movement, the Boycott, mm -hmm. Divestment, Sanctions movement? Uh, this question says that all 50 governors have signed uh, a letter to oppose BDS. I'm not sure that that's true. I saw the same announcement, and it's either a fact or it isn't, and I don't know, maybe someone here knows better than I, but I've been told that Governor Inslee here did not sign that uh, letter, but I, uh, others may know. But the question that comes from the audience is about BDS, and I suppose it's sort of when we move from history to the present, Absolutely. What, what, you know, the outcome of, of, of uh, settler colonialism is usually not very good for the Aboriginal people or the people who are, right. who are being displaced. History teaches us that that's not true. So can we people have a way of, of showing our, our, our uh, disdain for settler colonialism or however you want to portray the human rights mm -hmm. abuses of the Israelis and is BDS an, an appropriate outcome as the question okay. asks? Thank you. Um, the short answer is yes, but there is a longer answer. Um, and I'll divide it into two parts. One, I'll say something about the BDS and its importance. And the second part, I will venture of what I think can be a response, whether it's for 50 governors or 30 governors or 30 senators, I think there should be a, a response, which you should know even better than I how to do this. But let me start with the, with the BDS. The boycott, divestment, and sanction campaign, first of all, is a campaign that focuses on three basic rights which the Palestinians are denied. So when you support the BDS, it means that you believe that three basic rights uh, should be defended and safeguarded. The right of the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip not to live under military threat and occupation. The right of the Palestinians in Israel to live as equal citizens. And the right of the Palestinian refugees to return. So supporting BDS is first of all an, a positive action, not a negative action. You support basic human rights that in any other part of the world would be uh, supported without any hesitation. When the call for the BDS came from the boycott, divestment and sanction campaign, came from the Palestinian civil society in 2005, it's important to understand what this call for BDS symbolized. It symbolized, first of all, an, a, a strategy that said, we are looking for a non-violent strategy to stop our suffering. We're not calling for suicide bombers. We're not calling for violence. We are calling for a non-violent pressure from the outside to the state of Israel to tell it that there is a tech prize attached 
to their policies. That's what supporting the BDS means. The BDS is not uh, an autocratic, dictatorial movement. Uh, people are all over the world choose their own ways of how to implement the idea of a boycott, how to voice their resistance. So I think that's a very positive response by the international community that does not buy into the discourse of the politicians who said you cannot pressure Israel, it should allow to continue with its criminal policies as long as there is no peace. But the truth is that as long as Israel continues with its criminal policies, there will be no peace. So we first have to stop the criminal policies, and then maybe there will be peace. And that's what the BDS is all about. Now, you know, the, the BDS, the anti-BDS legislation or prospective anti-BDS legislation is not different from someone who tells you you should arrest an immigrant just because he's illegally here and send him back. You know yourself that there are churches in this country that violate this new legislation and give sanctuary to people whose only crime is that they were seeking life in this country and, are not, and the churches themselves are not willing to cooperate with those who are sent to send these illegal immigrants back to their countries of origin. You know that there are cities, there are mayors who declare themselves as sanctuary cities, including in this city. So we have an example what happens when senators or governments uh, legislate an immoral legislation. And anti-BDS is an immoral legislation on two bases. First of all, it's immoral to stay indifferent in the face of the Palestinian suffering and do nothing. And secondly, it's immoral to stifle freedom of speech through legislation just because you don't like what people are suggesting. So in the name of freedom of speech, in the name of your moral morality and humanity, you should take these governors to the Supreme Court. You should tell your, the people who you elect that you won't elect them if they would support this idea. Learn a little bit from APAC. They're, they're not. Let's have a counter APAC lobby and tactics in favor of the BDS. Let's intimidate them a little bit. All the time they intimidate, they are being intimidated. Most of these governors are intimidated by the Israelis. They don't believe, I, I doubt it whether they even bother to understand what BDS is. They understand that APAC doesn't like BDS. That's the only thing they know. So let's counter it. In this moment, in this century, to be timid and to cower in the face of uh, threats that come from a rogue state like Israel, is something that is unacceptable. Not in this century, definitely not in this city, and not among people of faith and of moral courage. Thank you. So I'm gonna combine two questions. Okay. Um, the first question is, uh, why does what happens in Palestine matter to the whole world? And I think this is an overlapping issue. It's basically asking if Israel has any moral right to exist, and I think those okay. two are related. Okay. L let me start with the second one, and, because I think it can lead to the, uh, the, the first one. Uh, you know, I, when I was quite often uh, invited to debates in the Oxford uh, Union uh, under the title, Does Israel Have the Right to Exist? And those who invited me expected me to be arguing for Israel's non-right to exist, so to speak. And I always refused. I refused because I don't think individuals can decide whether states have the right to exist or not. And I really don't think that this is the language. The important language is, does the regime that allows apartheid, colonization, dispossession, demolition of houses, arrest without trial. Is this regime, regime legitimate or not? That's the question. So I'm not dealing with Israel's right to exist or not to exist. 
I am trying to say to you, as I say to many others, and I'm not the only one, I wish the problem in Israel would be its current policies. I wish the problem in Israel would be its strategy. I wish the problem in Israel would be the problem of one political party, and all we have to do is wait for another Zionist political party to take over. I wish this would be the case, but it is not. The problem in Israel is its ideology. And as in apartheid South Africa, we did not expect a change in policy because a prime minister replaced another prime minister or uh, a policy replaced a policy. We needed to topple apartheid down and then we knew that there's a chance for a different future. And I think that shows us what is the importance of Palestine to the rest of the world. It is important because there is so much double talk about Palestine, and Israel has such an exceptional uh, status of immunity that you cannot have in the world a genuine discussion about the violation of human rights and civil rights elsewhere in general, and in the Middle East in particular. People will say to you, how can we trust the people who want to discuss with us the violation of human rights in Syria, or in Iraq, or in Saudi Arabia, when in this conversation we never include Israel? It means that the West does not really believe in a conversation about human rights, because there is a big exception. So first of all, the importance of Palestine, it's the exceptionalism of Israel. This does not really prohibits us from having an international conversation that we all need about human rights and civil rights. This is the biggest problem of the world today, that so many people do not have basic human rights and civil rights. The second reason that Israel uh, is so important, or that Palestine is so important, it is almost the last remaining issue which we can still say the justice matters. Not just the balance of power. This is a discussion I had with my good friend Noam Chomsky in the two books we wrote. He argues for realpolitik. And I kept claiming, and I still claim, no, no, Palestine is not about realpolitik. It's not about realism. If it was about realism, we should all support the Israelis and let them just swallow the Palestinians, because they are the biggest army in the Middle East. They are strong, the Palestinians are weak, the Palestinians have nothing to offer us, they don't have oil, they have nothing realistic to offer us that should justify our support for them. Even if you are Christians, the number of Christian Palestinians has dwindled in such a way, so you can't say I'm supporting them because they're Christians. We support them because it's one of the most vicious injustice that we have witnessed in the last 50 years. So we don't want to lose hope, I think, as human beings, that some policies can be based on justice as well. Every politician would do two things, especially in this country, but it's true of other countries. I'm not singling out America. They would talk on justice, and then they would tell you, you know, don't be naive. Justice has nothing to do with our policies. I think Palestine, as even Trump is going to learn, does not lend itself for this typical double talk of politicians, where they can take a mo high moral ground, but in the clo in behind closed doors, you know, sell arms to Saudi Arabia that violates basic human rights, and have all kinds of crypto diplomacy with the rest of the world. I think Palestine still symbolizes something that we don't want to lose as human beings, when we deal with this abstract notion of justice, I think it is translated into reality, a very clear reality on the ground in Palestine. This next question is a question about the, the voice of, of Palestinians in this discussion. So we, we, you've spoken of the, the history of the region, but we're not hearing Palestinian voices, and the question actually chastises us for not putting a Palestinian okay. voice on this, 
on this panel, which I think is 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 correct. I think I think you know we would want to hear that voice. So I guess the question to you would be, uh, what, what is the role of the Palestinian voice today? You 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 hinted it. Uh, maybe the next intifada would be directed towards the Palestinian Authority, yep. and I certainly, in my time in in uh, Palestine, uh, became convinced that most Palestinians are very unhappy with the current their current government, and and something's going to happen. Was was is what I concluded. But I'm I'm an outsider. I'm expressing what I think Palestinians think, and the question is, what what should their their voice be? First of all, yes, it would be nice to have Palestinians on, on the podium as well, of course. But I think it's important to understand that actually we talked about it in my visit here, that we should each talk, first of all, to our, to our own communities. And not, we don't need someone from the outside community because it's our job. It's our job as Christians to convince our colleagues that they should do their job. We don't need someone else to tell us this. It's my job as a Jew to tell the Jewish community that they should look at the mirror and understand who they are. There's, it's not the job of the Palestinians to do this. It's my job. It's my, it's my mission. It's my mission. I think that's why I'm, I'm here. Secondly, the question of Palestinian agency, I already hinted to it, but I can elaborate on this. I think that the Palestinians, for obvious historical reasons, because of the fragmentation that the Zionist movement caused, dividing the Palestinians to different five, bo uh, five groups, uh, because of the uh, change in the reality from the 1950s to the 21st century, where anti-colonialism uh, cannot be any more used successfully as, as an empowerment or a liberation uh, a movement, as it was probably could have been earlier on, need probably to redefine, the best way of putting it, they need to redefine the project of the liberation of Palestine in the way that fits 2070. And in that liberation project, they have to tell us, the Jews who live in Israel, if you want the third generation of settlers, how do they see our role in the future? There's something about the two-state solution that absolved the Palestinians from saying it. Because the vision was Israel controls 80% of Palestine, Palestine will be 20% of Palestine, and this is the future. Now this is not working and it's not going to work. So we need, we need a, an authentic, united, representative Palestinian body and leadership and community telling everyone who lives there, how does the future look? and not uh, wait for a response from someone else's program for the future. I think that's the main agency. And it's a big ask because when you are under occupation, when you're under uh, colonization, when you are under the danger of genocide, you, you, you can deal only with survival sometimes and less with strategy. But nonetheless, this is something can I follow up with yeah. this? Do you have any thoughts about the Palestinian community outside of Palestine? Because there are large Palestinian communities in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, in South America, whole villages left in 1948 or 1967. And what, do you see a role for, for, for this uh, Palestinian community and, and a voice for them in this? First of all, I think they're already fulfilling a very important role. Uh, the BDS movement, the Israel apartheid weeks in the campuses, the counter narrative to the mainstream media is in many places thanks to the activism of these communities. So they're not passive anymore, they're, they're, very, they're very active. So they already have a role. Of course, I think that uh, I just pointed out to the possible role that, but the, there needs to be a good structure for, for uh, facilitating this role, is that sometimes from the outside, you can more easily strategize them from the inside because you are not under existential danger. Because you don't care about what happens tomorrow. You can, you can look a bit further into the future. Do you mean something like a, a Palestinian APAC? More than that. I, I think what, what you can see it actually happening in the Facebook and the internet, especially among young Palestinians, because they can overcome uh, and transcend physical boundaries. 
So they can have, they have very clear conversations about the future, um, whether it's a one-state solution, whether it's the right of the Palestinian refugees to return. So I think, I'm thinking more about a popular movement than, than a lobby. It's not so much about, of course, they can also do advocacy. You're absolutely right. And, and they are doing it, and they should do it probably more efficiently and even more intensively. Um, but uh, it's not just a matter of advocacy. I think it's a matter of, if you want, the people of the land having the conversation about the future of the land, and not the people who are not of the land deciding what the future is to them. So again, I'm gonna try to combine two questions. So it's, it sounds like, um, the, in your view, the two-state solution is not a viable baby. Um, so then we're looking at some type of one-state solution. And um, then this question is asking if there is, it's possible for a settler colonial uh, effort to not end in total destruction of the indigenous population. And I think those are two parts of the same coin. Yeah. So I'm gonna put them together okay. as a question, yeah. Okay, first of all, settler colonialism was defeated also in certain places, so we have to remember this. Settler colonialism was defeated in South Africa, it was defeated in Algeria, it was defeated in Zimbabwe. So settler colonialism doesn't always succeed. Settler colonialism can be defeated. Uh, and doesn't have to end in the total destruction of the indigenous native people. And I'm very hopeful, I'm not just hoping, I'm quite convinced that the Palestinians are there to stay and they will not disappear. And I think actually the whole Zionist project would come to an end, it will come to an end. I, I'm not, I can't tell you when, I don't know exactly how, but I do think it is, its days are numbered. I don't think uh, that uh, given the developments on the, on the ground and everything else that is going around Israel and Palestine, I think the Israelis for their own sake should think about alternatives to what they have. Um, now, as for the one state solution, I, I think that because we, we are stuck with the two state solution, it's very difficult to have a profound discussion of the, the one-state solution. What we can have at this moment, because this is not the hegemonic discourse, what we can have at this moment is raising certain questions that I don't think we have to go and rush and answer them. We have to ponder upon them a little bit. I'll give you just one example to, to show you how, how I'm, at least I'm thinking about this whole idea of the one-state solution, and I have this to say in brackets. I belong to several groups of people uh, uh, who uh, meet sometimes monthly, sometimes bi-monthly, and come under the vague title of the uh, One Democratic State Movement. We have members who come from Gaza, from uh, the West Bank, from inside uh, what today is Israel, from the exilic communities of the Palestinians. Uh, we communicate with people in the refugee camps as much as we can. There is a conversation going on about the one state of Jews and Palestinians who are talking about it. Uh, and the one question that I think uh, very much symbolizes the difficulties, but these are not difficulties that should defeat the conversation. They just show what kind of conversation we should have. There is one model that says you have to defeat uh, totally the Zionist movement to such an extent that it doesn't matter anymore what the Jewish settlers or the Jewish in, Jews in Israel want. You know, a kind of a total defeat of the project almost kind of an image of Israel as a crusader state that would eventually be totally dismantled and defeated. Or you say to yourself, no, this is the 21st century. We don't have such examples anymore. And what you need is a change of regime, as I pointed before. Now that means that you do want to convince at least some of the Israeli Jews to change their ideological perception. Probably not all of them but at least enough among them 
so that the process would be successful. That's when people start talking about the binational state instead of the democratic state. Because when people talk of binational state, they say, okay, we recognize that the six million Jews who live today in Israel already created an ethnic group of themselves. They created their own culture, they have a collective identity, as do the Palestinians. And the state uh, uh, should also recognize their collective identity if they wish to maintain it. And maybe they can only maintain it within what is called a binational state. Um, and maybe even binationalism is something we have to rethink about because the Middle East as a whole, especially the Eastern Mediterranean, is all the time navigating between collective identities which are very important to people, whether it's because of their religion, their uh, region, or their culture. And we always navigate between the collective identity and protecting them and the individual identities. So we have to look, I think, for ideas that enable us to have this dialogue between the collective identity, the individual identity. And I don't think that the solution we'll find for Israel and Palestine would be that different from the one that we will find next door if we succeed in ending the bloodshed in our neighboring countries. What is important, of course, is to realize that a racist ethnic Jewish state is not the model of the future. That's the most important thing. And that's the common ground for discussing. And I think we should discuss more than one model. We should respect people who want a more religious public sphere, those who want a more secular public sphere. We won't easily solve these uh, uh, ideas, but you know, dialogues in, in non-Western society is never seen as, a, as something that has to lead to a solution. In non-Western societies, dialogue is a way of life, not a solution. And we have to find this, what I call the dialogical state that enables people with different ideas of morality, of individuality, and so on, somehow live together within a state that belongs uh, to everyone. You know, I, I couldn't help but think, as you were just commenting, that you, know, you, you are in a way of the land yourself now. You, 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 you lived there, you were a professor there, you must have family there uh, in, in what is now Israel. Uh, your views and your, your scholarship have placed you at odds with, with many of your own people and that's, there's been a personal toll. There has to be a personal toll on you. Would you share that with us for a moment, the personal toll? You, you've, you've given a wonderful scholarly lecture and some fabulous questions from our audience, but could, could, could we impose on you to just tell us what the toll has been for you to tell the truth as you know the truth to be? Yeah, uh, I, I'm willing to do it because I really think it's not that heavy that I don't expect other Israelis to do it. That's the important thing. Uh, I, I tell my friends in Israel you will pay a price, and I will describe to them exactly the price I paid. But I say to them, it's not high enough to justify your cowardness of not doing that. Uh, in my case, uh, I think uh, there are stages in, in, in that uh, challenge that you challenge your own society. There are moments which are terrifying, there are moments that are life-threatening, uh, and there are moments where you lose your job. Uh, but I think there is one thing that uh, really keeps you going. There is a, a moment, and I don't, I can't even know when, the, the, when it happened. But there's really a moment when you're so secure in your position uh, that you are so at peace with yourself uh, that suddenly things that terrified you, intimidate you, intimidated you, uh, are not working anymore to silence you or to even, even concern you. Uh, you know, uh, death threats uh, when you have small children are terrifying and not pleasant uh, and, and so on, but then you, you move on and you say, uh, this just shows that you probably have the right 
right answer to the challenges. Uh, so, so I think, yes, there is, there is a price. I, I should never complain too much. I found a great job outside of Israel, a beautiful place. Uh, I wasn't exiled to Siberia. I was exiled to Devon, which is very beautiful and very comfortable. And all the time you remember, and this is, this is my last sentence, you remember that whatever you went through doesn't even begin to compare uh, to the suffering of the people on whose behalf you are doing what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's been such a pleasure to have you here again. And um, it's been a full weekend, lots of different groups. And uh, it's been recorded, it's been photographed. Um, it'll be YouTubes, it'll be, uh, it'll be in a lot of places. So thank you everyone for coming and uh, let's go downstairs. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.